Earlier this year, it was announced that the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia was close to securing an 80% share of Newcastle United. Well, those were callers to Jim White's show on TalkSport earlier today after Jim broke the news about the Newcastle potential takeover. An investor group led by uh, Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund has apparently agreed a £300 million deal to buy Newcastle United. Uh, and it's about uh, dotting I's, crossing T's, etc. But time has passed and the deal still remains incomplete. In fact, the Premier League have an almighty dilemma on their hands. I just can't imagine a situation where someone who's implicated in murder is allowed to take over an English club. Oh, you, again, you're, you're asking me to talk about something that I, I, I simply can't. Not the obvious moral dilemma, but one that carries them into the esoteric world of broadcasting rights. It's been described as the biggest and most outrageous piracy operation in history, which has been allowed to continue for the past three years. But that might all change now after the World Trade Organization, one of the most important international bodies of jurisdiction, issued its findings into the case of Saudi Arabia and the theft of TV broadcasting rights. The introduction of a Saudi player in the marketplace of the Premier League puts the league at the heart of a row that has riven the Middle East for the last three years. In this episode, we ask, how could a broadcast rights deal scupper the Saudi takeover of Newcastle United? Everyone likes a battle between you know wealthy bidders and you know, whether you're selling your house or selling your car you want to try and tempt people into the market Matt Slater is a football news and investigations reporter at The Athletic the sort of battle for soft power and influence and a brand between these wealthy Gulf states has very much crossed over into the sports and entertainment sector For what they do in life echoes in eternity. Battles for the Scudetto begins August 20th on BN Sports. Let's start from last weekend's news. BN Sports holds the rights to the Italian top flight that resumed on Saturday with Torino hosting Parma. But fans in the 35 territories where BN Sports holds the rights were met by a blue screen. What had happened? Well, that's pretty much it. As you say, they're the rights holder. They they hold the rights for all manner of sports. They're I mean, a huge player. But they just did not broadcast Syria that weekend. And they put a little note out on, on social media to say, you know, we're not doing so. But it was pretty much as simple as that. The history of this particular dispute goes back to last year, where Syria A signed a €7 million Euro contract to host three Supercoppa Italiana final matches in Saudi Arabia. Why might this have been an issue for Bian? Well, this is where we get to the you know the heart of it. Bian are, are based in Doha. They're they're a Qatari company. Saudis often refer to them dismissively as the kind of Al Jazeera of sports. Al Jazeera, of course, is another Qatari company that's achieved considerable success and infamy in certain countries. There's absolutely no way of sort of discussing this this whole conversation really without getting into the fact that Qatar have been in dispute with their neighbours now for, uh, I think, about three years. So Qatar is this tiny country that, starting with its independence just in 1971, was really dominated by the more powerful Saudi Arabia. And no country likes to be dominated by a neighbour, even if they both speak Arabic, export energy, and have Sunni monarchies. So Qatar decides it has to rival Saudi Arabia if it wants autonomy. Saudi, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Egypt in particular, and a few other countries severed economic, diplomatic ties in 2017. It was a a very dramatic event and situation. And and many people thought that it would be resolved by now, but it it hasn't. It's rumbled on and it continues to be pretty bitter, to be honest. The situation, of course, then with BN being this very prominent Qatari company is that they've got very upset with any country, with any rights holder that hasn't defended them against mainly Saudi-backed piracy. They have long felt that Italy and Syria have not done enough, not done as much as its other partners, its other broadcast partners, and have been have been sort of really trying to kind of cajole Syria to take it as seriously as maybe the Premier League have, for example. And then to compound that, 
the Italian Football Federation took money from Saudi to, to take those games to Saudi Arabia, um, which to the Qataris and to be in was, you know, just what are you doing? You know, not only are you not doing enough to to fight, to tackle, to back us against Saudi funded uh, piracy, you're then taking Saudi checks to take games there. That's not on. In 2017, shortly after the kingdom and three of its allies imposed a land, air and sea blockade on Qatar, a new television network was unveiled named Be Out Q. The new channel was nothing more than a piracy operation that stole the signal and output from Be In Sports and rebroadcast it around the world. On top of this, we have Be Out Q, a Saudi-based piracy company that repackages Qatar-based Be In Sports channels around the Arabic-speaking world. Can you give us a brief history of the tension that exists between these two broadcasters? Well, I mean, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, you know, BNR, a legitimate company, as I say, based in Doha, they've invested billions in sports rights, not just in the UK, but around the world. NFL, the Olympics, F1, huge, huge investors in British sport, Wimbledon, rugby, but lots and lots of football. BLQ, I wouldn't necessarily call them a company. I think they would probably be pretty offensive to be in. They're a pirate operation. Uh, They were set up a week or so after that diplomatic dispute started, very much a play on be in, of course, be out Q. They started off by just basically hacking be in signal and distributing it via Arabsat, which is a satellite company based in Riyadh. All the Gulf countries are partners in that, but it's majority work. The biggest shareholder is is Saudi, The, the bosses are Saudi. The piracy operation is probably the most sophisticated we've seen. It is now morphed into IPTV. So whilst the satellite link has been turned off after much pressure, including from the British government and FIFA and UEFA, the IPTV operation, you know, through through basically dodgy set top boxes continues and continues to steal not just be in signal, but Sky's partners around the world, broadcast companies around the world even the BBC, Netflix, NBC, you name it, for 60 odd dollars a year, you kind of get everything and it's all stolen. So to say there's tension between these two is something of an understatement. And inevitably the result of these disputes was legal action. It's been described as the biggest and most outrageous piracy operation in history, which has been allowed to continue for the past three years. But that might all change now after the World Trade Organization, one of the most important international bodies of jurisdiction, issued its findings into the case of Saudi Arabia and the theft of TV broadcasting rights. The way intellectual property theft tends to work is, you know, you are under international treaties that pretty much every country has signed up to. The principle is the sort of offended party should pursue that case in the country where the theft is taking place. So being tried to do that. Now, the nature of the split between Saudi and Qatar, which is particularly bitter, probably the most bitter of all those countries I I mentioned in a previous answer, is that that just became impossible. So being was was basically outlawed as as a company in Saudi very quickly. Being had no legal recourse, no lawyer, would take their case on. No court would listen to them in Saudi. No government agency would listen to them. So the normal avenues to take legal action were denied them, which has forced them to be quite creative and to try and take cases kind of almost on an ad hoc basis wherever they can. You know, they've tried in the States, they've tried in France, wherever there might have been a sort of specific issue on that territory. And then as a sort of kind of tandem approach, they've gone through this very long-winded and complicated World Trade Organization approach where they have Qatar, this is where it becomes a state to state, not necessarily be in suing someone, but Qatar has effectively taken Saudi Arabia to international arbitration. It is asking for a billion dollars, which is really just the cost of this to be in for the first six months of the piracy. So they are working their way through, through that process. And then the other thing is they made a complaint to the World Trade Organization. And we've, that was the report we had a couple of weeks ago now. And look, everything about this whole subject is debated and disputed and must be viewed through the prism of this very bitter rivalry between Qatar and Saudi, both sides sort of kind of claiming victory. But I think most neutral, independent people, most experts I've spoken to, saw that as a big win for Qatar because they got the WTO 
to agree on the main principles of what's going on here. Now, this legal posturing impacts directly on the Premier League. Why is that the case? Well, absolutely. So this is why this dispute between people you know, a long, long way away, you know, why, why should we care about this? Well, perhaps we shouldn't care about this. I mean, I, I would argue we should because, as I say, being are a major partner of the Premier League and their product is being stolen. And if we don't take theft seriously, then the value of our rights, the value of all sports rights will fall. And that will hurt every single club, every single sports fan. If that's what you care about, if you care about, you know, having great players, great managers, wonderful stadiums, the value of rights is important. So I suppose that's the first thing. The second thing, and more specific, is about Newcastle United. Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund, the public investment fund, which is run by the crown prince, run out of his office. He's used it as his tool to exert power and influence in Saudi Arabia. It's basically the money behind a long and protracted takeover of Newcastle United. They're going to end up with about 80% of the shares. Now, that is an arm of the Saudi government. Qatar and BIN feel the same way about BLQ. Now, now, there can be an element of debate about that, and that's fine. But the bottom line is, for three years, the Saudi Arabian government has failed to tackle BLQ. So within the Premier League's owners and directors test, there are various questions that ask that it's almost a checkbox exercise you know have you done this you know are you banned for being a director can you bring your money into the country lots of things that 99 percent of us would, would pass but there is unfortunately a question about piracy you know you're involved in that have you done something abroad that would be considered a crime here and have you dealt with us in the utmost faith and and um, you know have you been honest in your dealings with the premier league the premier league have been helping be in for the last three years the premier league have tried to sue in Saudi Arabia themselves nine times and no Saudi lawyer will take them on. You know, the Premier League have have been very, very enthusiastic and good supporters of being throughout this dispute. So this is a massive problem for the Saudi government who are now trying to buy a Premier League club. So it seems as though there's an almost intractable problem here for the Premier League. You've got Saudi Arabia wanting to buy a football club in the Premier League on the one hand, and then you have Qatari-owned BN Sports, who are an important broadcast rights holder for the Premier League, on the other hand. Can the Premier League have their cake and eat it here? Well, look, I mean, yes, there are lots of ways of seeing this. It's the old sort of adage, isn't it, about, you know, crisis being an opportunity. So I guess a worst case scenario would be they annoy both parties. So they, so they, they annoy Saudi Arabia and, you know, that deal sort of falls apart. Then you don't get the excitement of a new wealthy backer getting behind another club, perhaps creating a big seven, a big eight, revitalising one of our sort of oldest, most famous clubs. You know, the fan base there are desperate for new ownership. They're fed up with Mike Ashley. If you sort of block that and upset the Saudis, there's kind of potential lose-lose there. You know, bringing Saudis in, well, you know, that could be great in terms of a future broadcast partner because what's the best case here? The best case scenario would be you know, you deal with BN's immediate problems, like you use the leverage you have over the Saudis right now who want to buy one of our clubs. You say to them, well, look, sort out your issues around BN, really shut down BLQ as opposed to sort of, you know, dance around the edges. Take some responsibility for what's happened over the last three years. Yes, you can have your football club. You know, yes, you can invest in Newcastle United. And who knows, the next time the rights come up in the Middle East and North Africa, why don't you form a Saudi-based legitimate version of BN, and then we'll have a bidding contest. Fantastic, and everyone's a winner there. So there's a kind of sort of lose-lose, and there's a sort of win-win, and there's probably every sort of uh, variety in between as well. Hi, everyone. It's co-host Josh Schneider-Weiler here, and I have an announcement. Next Monday is our 100th episode of Football Today, and to celebrate it, we're giving away a 60-pound gift card to Classic Football Shirts to one of you, our listeners. That's 60 pounds you can spend however you like at ClassicFootballShirts.com, and believe me, it can buy a lot on that website. All you need to do is fill in a five-minute survey to enter. It's only 15 questions or so, and it gives us really important feedback on what you guys think of the show. So please help us out and fill in that survey. And just so you know, this opportunity won't be marketed on social media, so it's only for you guys listening right now, which means you have a much better chance at winning. To fill in the survey and have a chance at winning that 60 pound gift card, please click the link in the episode description or log on to our website, www.footballtodaypodcast.com. Now, back to the episode. (laughs) 
All this Middle Eastern posturing makes it all too obvious how important broadcasting rights have become within the modern game. In many respects it feels as though we're at an important juncture of history when it comes to the way the game is brought to its audience. I asked Matt about the future of broadcasting rights and the impact it will have on us as consumers. Last year, b Media CEO Youssef al Albaidi said, Seemingly everyone in this industry is asleep at the wheel and refuses to confront the piracy elephant that's been in the room for years. We now live in a world where exclusive broadcast rights are effectively wholly non-exclusive. Think about that, non-exclusive. Consumers, young and old, are accessing everything for nothing via a Kodi or a VPN or b Q, Wherever they are, whenever they like. And this behaviour is being normalised. How concerned should leagues be about online piracy? Very. It's a huge issue and it has been for you know, 15, 20 years. So just to unpick that statement. Be Out Q is interesting because it is, as I say, very sophisticated. Be and have thrown everything at this to try and shut them down, constantly changing their streams. Because a lot of this is based on impounded be in boxes and, and, and equipment in Saudi Arabia. But because it is so sophisticated, and, and when you look at it, it looks like a legitimate product. It's not like something we've seen before. You know, the Premier League has, over the years, one of, one of the reasons the Premier League is where it is in the world is that it has this very, very close relationship with its broadcast partners, most particularly, and obviously in this country, Sky, but NBC in the States, being in North Africa and Middle East and a few others. And it's done that by supporting them against piracy. So one of the one of these sort of interesting things the Premier League did was they opened this office in Singapore a year or so ago. Now that was of course to help with sort of sponsorship and and, and you know building the brand over there. But one of the main things that office does it was boots on the ground. It was to fight piracy in the Far East. And you see that with the Premier League. They will go after pub landlords that are having lock-ins and pulling the curtains and, and showing illegal feeds of games. They will prosecute here, they will prosecute abroad, and they will back their broadcast partners. Now, one of the interesting things that Be In have done is that they handed back their F1 rights a year or so ago because they didn't think F1 was doing much in the fight against piracy. I also think that maybe F1, they perhaps overpaid for that. But but one of the reasons they gave is, look, we are struggling, we are laying people off. This be out queue situation has really hurt us. We're gonna look at our secondary rights, if you like, and we will hand them back. And that is the position that Serie A are finding themselves in right now. If you don't take piracy as seriously as the Premier League do, we're gonna drop you. The broadcasting rights model is premised on the idea that football is entertainment. This weekend we heard that the Saudi Arabian Qatari posturing is set to be extended into the realm of French football with the potential sale of Marseille to the PIF of Saudi Arabia. As more and more people recognise that elite football has become a battleground between Middle Eastern states, do you think people are going to start losing interest and the entertainment aspect of football is lost? Football, sport, has always been entertainment. The crucial thing about why its rights have gone through this sort of sort of 20-year incredible rise really and you know what might happen next I think is really interesting is that it's live entertainment at a time when the kind of broadcast model has completely changed I mean most of us are time shifting now there's been a proliferation of channels we've gone through sort of box sets we're now into kind of the sort of streaming era where we are not all sitting down to watch the massive Saturday evening show together you know the days of you know of MASH or even EastEnders or whatever it might be commanding these massive audiences when we all feel we're going to be part of this cultural moment if we're going to have something to talk about at the office or school on Monday morning we have to have seen this thing at the same time together the exception to that one of the few exceptions to that is sport you know for all the old reasons of trying to sort of avoid the result you kind of want to watch the best sport together and there are very few moments like that now I mean like maybe the last Game of Thrones it's that sort of thing really which is why if you look at the ratings every year in the States the top 20 would be 19 NFL games and that's why live sports rights are so important now to, to get to your point about you know what happens in terms of the Middle East well look you know that unfortunately that door is open we, we you know we've already let the Qatari sovereign wealth fund in and they've bought PSG. Of course, you've kind of got Abu Dhabi. They've put a little kind of company in between them and Man City, but it's effectively 
owned and run by the Abu Dhabi royal family, Sheikh Mansour. So, you know, the, the sovereign wealth fund era in football has started. Gulf states are involved. Qatar, of course, has the next World Cup, which again is one of the reasons why there is this sort of intense rivalry between them and Saudi Arabia. The Marseille thing, I think, is really interesting. I think I've seen the newspaper report. I, have, I think there are some issues around that story. If Saudi Arabia are going to buy a club in the Premier League, they are presumably going to want that club to do well in Europe. Having another European club that they also want to do well in Europe is going to be very, very difficult for them. I mean, that is not allowed by UEFA. So I have some issues with that particular story. Let's turn to look at the European context now. We've just seen Germany expand its TV rights into a two-tier system between Sky Sports Germany and DAZN. Is this tiering of broadcast rights the accepted model now? Every market's a little bit different. You know, if you look at the NFL, they've been for years had you know several tiers, and uh, you know they they've sort of parcelled up the entire kind of NFL week between about four or five companies, and they're the front runners. I mean, the Premier League are catching fast, basically because soccer is a global game with global appeal. That's something maybe the NFL doesn't quite have or the NBA doesn't quite have. But, you know, the the Premier League has also used a little bit of that NFL approach to sort of parcel up the weekend, try and bring other players in. You know, there's an element of the European Union as well have played a part there in their kind of anti-monopoly approach to sort of drive competition. They think that's good for the consumer. If I was, you know, speaking on behalf of Sky, I would say, well, look, One of the key reasons that that the Premier League has done well and we've done well, it's been very mutually beneficial, is if you are a Premier League fan, it was very, very important to us, Sky, that we had the most live games. You know, if you you really, really love Premier League and you you had to have your Premier League fix, well, then you had to come to us. And I think that model will continue for a bit longer because Sky, it's so intrinsic to their business model, to who they are, really. They're, they're not going to give that up easily. They've slowly sort of tried to wean themselves from their dependence on football by investing in, you know, great drama and, and what have you and good news. But football, live sport is still absolutely essential to Sky. So I don't see that going away straight away. You know, BT have come in and been an interesting partner. They've they've picked up the Europe, you know, they've really gone after Champions League rights. They think that's good for them. You know, the Premier League are desperate because they're all thinking about the next big, you know, where's the next big growth market? What what's the fuel that's gonna kind of lift us all again? And it's the streaming company. So, you know, that's why they've you know they bent over backwards to bring Amazon in and and of course, we've seen the zone in, in, in Germany and elsewhere, you know, Canada, um, there's a few other countries, I think Brazil, um, you know, the zone, are, lots of people have a lot of interest and faith and hope that they're going to be this big player. Eleven's another big streaming company that, that are interesting, you know, and we're all kind of waiting to see if Google, Facebook, Apple are going to sort of join the, the fray as well. Different markets will take different approaches, but, you know, parceling up of your assets, it makes sense. I think the German deal is interesting because it's the first major deal since the coronavirus pandemic. That figure stayed relatively stable this time around, although there was a slight decrease in value. Has a point of saturation been reached? Will we ever see the prices paid for broadcast rights creeping up again? It's certainly the first big deal in one of the big leagues. And it fell. I mean, I think if you're going to be be honest about it. But then you, if you were going to be honest about it, you'd say that the Premier League's domestic deal fell last time as well. That was last year before we'd even heard of coronavirus. So I think there has been this... Well, the last 10 years have just been remarkable, where every sort of new three-year cycle, certainly for the Premier League, that's very hard to sustain forever. And people have been predicting that that bubble would burst for some time and being wrong, to be honest. I mean, the Premier League rights in particular have been remarkably resilient coming through a credit crunch and any kind of you know, previous slowdown. I think we have now reached the top end of that kind of pay TV model, the kind of satellite revolution that started early 90s and that just that is the story of the Premier League success that that you know just just the timing of it just when we were all getting into the satellite TV and that close relationship they've had with Sky and you know the other leagues were kind of left behind a little bit but but have you know spent the last five ten years catching up I think we've reached the end of that and I think the next big jump we'll get and we're all looking around at each other going well you know how's it going to work when is it going to really happen is, is streaming 
You know, that's that's where we're moving towards. And I think what's interesting about the German deal, of course, is that it is a, it's a hybrid, isn't it? It's 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 streaming. It's a traditional broadcaster, a big traditional power now. We're seeing something similar in the Netherlands, in Belgium. It, it's sort of toes in water time. Where and and you know the Premier League, as I say, tried it as well with giving Amazon a couple of small packages, and 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 that was a big success, I think, for both parties. In the age of pandemic, we're seeing football being played primarily to fulfil television contracts. Do you think broadcast rights holders wield too much power in modern football? It depends what you want. And as a fan, I mean, I don't follow a Premier League team. I follow a, a much smaller EFL team and, and they are of very limited appeal to anybody who doesn't follow that fan you know no one will be watching South End United games if you don't have skin in the game if you don't have a dog in that fight and that I think is the case for the vast majority of sports teams in whatever sport it is they compete the thing about the Premier League and some of these other massive leagues La Liga or the NFL NBA is they are of global significance the IPL in cricket and they are worldwide events and they are very very attractive to large media companies they are prime rights they are some of the best assets that a media company can can own and that brings benefits then to those leagues it it, it has enabled them to motor away from everybody else that's why we have a sort of big five league that's why the premier league is is the biggest of those five and it's why we have a big six within the premier league they have all elevated their status they've moved away And they have every single player. If you look at those squads, I mean, think how things have changed, you know, 20, 30 years. Every single player in those in those teams and their immediate replacement will be an international. So do broadcasters exert too too much power? Maybe. But then let's not forget why those teams are so good, why the stadiums are so good, why the managers so good. It's the broadcasters that bring 70 percent of the revenue to the Premier League. And at some clubs, it's more like 85%. So when they are the biggest person around that table, of course, they're going to exert you know, an awful lot of influence. Do you think the recent pandemic will change the thought process on a potential over-the-top broadcasting service for the Premier League where they take control of their broadcasting rights and put out streaming services of their own? I don't know. I think it's an interesting question. What we do know is that they were thinking about it anyway, and that's sensible. You know, They are, they are very good at this. If you look at the US sports scene, the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, all have something a bit like this, more for their global overseas audiences than domestically. The Premier League have been thinking about this. The Premier League were very close in the last right cycle, so the packages they sold in 2018, starting last season, to have a go. And I've reported this in the past, that they really strongly thought about trying it in Singapore, because Singapore was sort of the right size in terms of audience, but the right size in terms of the deal they had with their existing partner. And as it happened, they decided against it. But I can see that idea coming back. It's never gone away. It would mean a big scaling up in terms of staff or, the, I suppose, the other, the other way, you just you know buy all that, that in. But it, it would mean a change, wouldn't it? Because it would involve the Premier League going from being kind of just sort of a kind of competition organiser that is very good at selling its rights and licensing its rights to, you know, a streaming company, to a street, to, to someone that can do that. And that means, you know, having a billing department. It means having an advertising department. It means probably having a customer services department. It means having a direct relationship with customers, which they haven't had before. So it's definitely in their minds and I think it will be really interesting and other sports have tried it whether the pandemic will make that happen sooner or later I don't know I I suspect not actually I think it's just something that that they are planning anyway and they will try it at some point but I think it will be a, a relatively small overseas market first so what do you think the future of broadcasting rights looks like now well, I think it's going to carry on like this for a little bit longer. With, as I said, the Skies and the and the BTs, maybe to a lesser extent, but certainly the, the Sky 
that kind of having a dominant partner who has the majority of your live rights so that they have you know this sort of compelling story to, to sell if you like that will continue because that is guaranteed money it's it's nice and safe clubs love it they love the certainty of these three-year deals and the premier league you know quite like it because it enables them to concentrate on other things to, you know to get these rights deals off and out the way but equally everyone can see that the way we consume is changing you know you, you, know, you have to look at the way kids consume anything these days on mobile devices they love watching clips they love making their own stuff there is a, a really interesting change in the way we view and watch sport going on and to ignore that would be foolish and the Premier League are not foolish. So I think we are in a really interesting moment where we're at the end of something that's worked brilliantly for 20 odd years and there's something exciting around the corner. It's not quite ready yet, though none of those streaming companies are actually making much money at the moment. In fact, they're mostly losing money. But I think everyone's aware that they're the future. So that's where we're at. An exciting time. You can read all of Matt Slater's investigative work over at The Athletic. This episode was produced by Josh Schneiderweiler. I'm John McKenzie. Thanks for listening to Football Today. If you enjoy this podcast, why not subscribe to our Patreon and get a raft of bonus material? Or, if you can't spare the cash, why not help us out by sharing an episode with a friend? See you next time.